Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I have leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. First Centier Investors is a global asset management group managing $247.3 billion of assets as at 30th of September 2021. They have 17 independent teams operating across equities, fixed income, listed and direct infrastructure, and multi-asset, led by principles of responsible investment and stewardship. They are home to FSSA Investment Managers, an Asian and global emerging markets equities investor. Stuart Investors, a pioneer in emerging market equities and sustainable investing. And Real Index Investments, a systematic equities manager. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor podcast here and today uh, I'm really excited to be here with Tavorjan Rasaya. Uh, he is the founder and principal advisor at Rasaya Private based out in Melbourne. Uh, Tavorjan, thanks for joining us, buddy. Good to have you here. Yeah, good to see you, Ben, and uh, great to be on again. Mate, so you're a, a big friend of, of the show, but um, I don't know. People say that I'm a better interviewer than Clayton Daniel. I'll let you be the judge at the end. You you just let me know. <laughs> but mate, so I'm, I'm keen to I'm keen to chat a bit about your service. I know you do things a little differently and unpack some of the learnings um, and how that's all come about. But before we do, uh, I'm keen to selfishly pick your brain a little bit on uh, growing a team and um, the yeah the people side of your business. Um, I know for a lot of people, it's it's a big challenge at the moment. We're talking about this great reshuffle in the in the in the marketplace. A lot of good businesses struggling to hire, um, ours included. That we've you know been on this recruiting campaign for what seems like forever, but definitely really heavily in the last six months. So I yeah, like we I think we all recognise as business owners and even as team members within a team that. You know, the team ends up being the business, like it's like the crucial part of what we do and how it gets done and how we support our clients. Uh, I'm, I'm keen to unpack, like, what are some of the, the key lessons that you've learned on your team building journey? Yeah, look, I mean, building the team is so, it's such a challenge because, as you said, the people are incredibly important uh, for the delivery of everything. You know, we're a people business, we're helping just real people and you know the, having the right team members is critical for the the delivery of that um yeah. and i guess like in any business you know having the people the right people to work together as well is is a challenge so yeah, yeah. It, it's it's really hard and and I, I don't think i've got any answers of how to do it but i do know that what we've tried to do is not just look at people on paper but really try and get deeper with them in a, in a sense it's similar to how we work with our clients but um mm. really trying to get deeper with people to understand what's important to them and making sure that the drivers that they have for coming to work are in alignment with what we do in the business um mm. so i think that's that's really important as well as knowing that they're going to gel with other team members as well so depending on how you run your team um knowing that whoever's going to come in is going to fit in with that so so for example we have an approach where we try and keep it very flat in terms of our structure um, yep. i'm happy to sit there you know licking stamps if i need to to send things out to clients or yeah. wrap you know wrap christmas presents uh you know me and the other senior advisor simone we sat we, we got together and caught up for four hours and wrapped wrap books to send out to clients um, last year yeah. and you know you, you do what you got to do so I mean from our cultural perspective we need everyone to be comfortable that it's it's not about us as individuals it's about the clients at the end of the day and the business and getting done whatever needs to be done so you roll your sleeves up you know you help each other out so that's one of the things that's as an example 
of, of we always look for that mm. those characteristics. Um, the other thing is we we look at character, character, and what's important to people. We because we take a heavy uh, focus on purpose and values with our clients, um, where it's mm. not just about making lots of money. Um, we think that our staff and team members also need to have a similar approach. Um, and yeah. so we look for those sorts of things. Um, in terms of, you know, you, uh, I mentioned earlier, not just looking at people on paper as well. I think skills are skills and experience and knowledge in particular areas, you know, is important and it, and it helps, but I tend to prefer to find aptitudes. So people that want to learn people that are good at learning people that have the right way of thinking about things because, um, mm. and I've seen this before I've picked up staff before who ended up being really, really good. And they found it hard to get a role because they didn't have X plan experience, for example. Yeah. Um, but, but we sort of said, well, that's okay. We'll teach them that. And, and lo and behold, we hired them and they picked it up, you know, super quickly and, you know, mm. it, it, it actually didn't, didn't, didn't impact, impact their ability to do the job, whether they knew X plan or not beforehand, what they needed to show was the ability and the desire to want to learn and the ability to learn. So, um, I think that's, that's again, how, how we approach it anyway. Yeah. And, and practically, how do you do that? Because you, you know, you mentioned a handful of things there, you're talking about alignment, you know, the cultural side, the purpose, uh, also aptitude, ability to learn and, and pick things up. For me, I find it challenging to, um, yeah, to, to assess all of those things when you're having conversations. And our interview process has, has evolved significantly. I've been lucky enough to have the help of a, a really good mate of mine who is a, a organizational psychologist and he helped to sort of pull out what are the core competencies for the role and then there's a bunch of like recognized ones and then there's all these questions that you can ask around um, you know situational type questions to give examples of things we also do a bit of psychometric testing and profiling and um, even we've got like a work sample in there but I still find that the big gap for for individuals is that how do you have someone like you say some of those things that you ability to pick things up and um, really to work well in a team and to deal with challenges and setbacks and those sorts of things and like you can ask tons of questions but I don't know like it's um yeah I just go shit sometimes you don't know until you suck it and see and then if you have a you know a bad experience with getting the wrong person that's bad for everybody. And you, you know, you think of the time impact and the costs that come with doing that. It's like total nightmare. So, so you're trying to do everything you can, but I just go, there's just like, I don't know. I just wish that there was a, a test or you could just stick a camera on someone and follow them around for a month, <laughs> see how they work and, and live and stuff. But uh, how, how do you uh, actually tackle those sort of less apparent um, traits and attributes? Yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. It's 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 so hard, um, and you can do. Again, I don't have any answers. I actually don't know. The way that we have done it is doing it in different ways. Early on, I just you know talked to people myself and um, found people that I already knew that sort of thing. Um, I then used recruiters, um, you know, a specialist financial planning recruiter, help with a couple of hires, which which worked to a certain extent. Um, excuse me. I've also used um, one of my business coaches who's, you know, I've had different business coaches for different things at different phases and different stages of the business. And so mm. tapping into their expertise has been helpful. So one of those coaches helped recruit for our operations person. And it was very much about identifying the rights, the way that they think, as opposed to anything on paper, because it was more of an operations role, not an advice related role. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. So and, and, and they went through a whole lot of psychometric testing, um, numbers of interviews, um, as we did as well. Um, and then I've also had another business coach where we've done a different type of testing, more around motivation testing and things like that to compare what motivates our people. Um, there's yeah. this, there's this system that we use that was really insightful for me uh, a couple of years ago called motivation mapping. And so one of our, um, coaches introduced that and we've used that with all the staff that come in to help each other understand the other team members motivations um, yeah. which was which was that's been really insightful for me actually 
um, the, the premise of it, just really quickly, is that we're all motivated by different things. And a really good example is I like thinking of ideas and how we can take the business forward and how we can do do something better, for example. So I'm always coming with a, with ideas. Um, yeah. And so, you know, in a team meeting, I'll be like, oh, guys, you know, I've thought of this, you know, what do you think about this, blah, 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 and I'll be going on about it and, and just see that they're not really getting getting up and about it about it and so i just kept talking about it more and going oh i've got to tell them more about it you know why isn't it yeah. interesting? And, um after doing this motivational mapping thing i real realized that the drivers that i have are different to the drives that they have so um because we've recruited well a lot of the team and, and people in different roles there are some people in the roles where they just they're motivated by getting stuff done by ticking things off their list and yeah. so if i'm talking about a new idea for me, that yeah, me. but for them, she's not going to do the work. Yeah, they're like, here we go again. He's got another idea. I've got a bunch of work sitting on my desk, and he's crapping yeah. about something that you know that isn't <laughs> yeah. really going to help. So, um, so now in those team meetings, when I do start, I go, hey guys, by the way, if I'm going on about something and you've got work that you need to get it done, just let me know because um, that's what I will. I, you yeah. know, I can go on like that. So, yeah. um, that was really insightful for me that that exercise. Mm, yeah, I'm definitely um, going to look, look that up um, post this yeah. conversation for sure because it's – Yeah, the, go on. I was just going to say, yeah, it's all about that, how people think. I know that we are, and we got this through our business coach that they're big on wealth dynamics profiling and it's the same thing that you've got different energies of people. And for me, that's been a huge help in communicating and explaining things to different people at different seats in the, in the team. But, yeah, it's all those mm. – oh, yeah, all of those things that are important to – because it's great to have great team members, but then you want to have a great team that works well effectively. And it's like two different things as well that I know for me, one of the big learnings over the last little while is you go, okay, it's great. Let's get great people. But then you, you have to translate that to say, how do we work? How do we work really well to together? Mm-hmm. Definitely. To, to, to answer your broad question in terms of how do you, how do you cut through, you know, we've got tests, we've got different processes for recruiting and things like that. But I haven't found any way that helps apart from having lots of conversations um, mm. and having lots of conversations. Uh, I guess we call them interviews, don't we, in recruiting. So having mm. lots of interviews or conversations and, you know, getting off topic, getting off, get, getting into conversations that's not about the job or the role, um, getting to know people at that deeper level, that has really helped. And, yeah, I find it really hard to go through the, in, the the interview and the sorry the re- the recruitment process I'd say um, mm. and so that judge of character has only but worked by having you know some of those extra conversations you don't know still don't get it right all the time but it definitely helps um, yeah. you might pick up on something and you go you know there's something that just doesn't fit there um, yeah. and um, you know our our ops guy Peter. You know, shout out to Peter, who's, who's just started, moved down from Sydney, uh, started with us in August, but moved down in January to start with us. He's, you know, because he was based in Sydney, it was, I was almost trying to find reasons why he shouldn't come on board because I could just see there's a lot of risk in that, you know, hiring someone yeah. that's got to move. Um, but yeah. every conversation, he just kept, it just made sense. And then it just, uh, yeah. he had the right experience. He had, he, he had the right way of thinking and going about things. So, yeah, that, that was a that was a really interesting um, piece as well. Yeah, well, mate, based on the fact that he's prepared to move from Sydney to Melbourne, I would say that he's deeply committed. So you should commend that. I, w- I would say because that's uh, oh, that's absolutely. Last last question on hiring is just around advisor hiring, and it sounds like you've got a great you know senior advisor in the in the business already, as well as you know senior. Um, team members that you know we're looking to hire advisors at the moment and it's something that I've found challenging to find you know you've got a reasonably unique sort of service offering business and and approach well I wouldn't say you well it's probably unique in a lot of ways but like uncommon as well that I found that there's a lot of advisors that have a, a lot of experience and they're probably fantastic advisors as advisors but when you think about all of the things that you want for your role and you know, finding the right, not only a great advisor, but a great advisor for your business and clients and team and approach. Like, um, what what would you say are the the key lessons that you learned uh, around that, or what do you think is is really important in going down that path? 
Yeah, so with hiring advisors, you know, you know, I'm, I'm again not that experienced in that, so I don't don't have have any of the answers for you. You know, you've been through it a bit more than me, but um, we've got yeah, it's myself, and then I've got one senior advisor, and she's the only advisor I'd, I've had to recruit. Um, so shout out to Simone, she's um, you know really experienced advisor, smart lady. Um, it was hard to figure out, you know, find the right person. So I came across Simone through a recruiter. But it was really the conversations again, again with her, it was multiple. She didn't want to jump into a role either. She was being quite taking her time to find the right role and something that, that felt right. So yeah. um, that helped to a certain extent because you're not, you're not running to this timeline of, oh, they want to quickly get a job and we want to quickly hire. It was mm. kind of a, you know, it took time. We had multiple conversations, had some coffees, really got to understand motivations, you know, what's important in her life and, and getting that right alignment. And and our business is quite different to what she was used to as well. So mm. as you said, the way that we give advice was was very different to what she was used to, but she really she really connected with the way that we do things. So she could see why doing things a different way might actually be be beneficial um and and you know she's been with us for a couple of years now but she still says i'm still constantly trying to you know trying to not undo but trying to change the the last 20 years of doing things a certain way i can yeah. see why doing it this way might is better from her perspective um yes. and, and so it becomes a motivation and a positive Mm. Um, and I think that's important as well, because sometimes if, if, if you're recruiting someone who's moving from a different environment to a new environment, the, I guess the automatic thing is that it's a negative that you have to do things differently or you have to change the way you're doing things. Yeah. So having, having someone who's willing to do things differently, even though it's going to be a challenge and it's going to be harder, um, yeah. and, and connecting with it at a level where they go, no, I can see why this is better. And, um, and, and I want it, and I want to do it because it's better for clients and those sorts of things. Then yeah. all those things help. I think all those things help. Yeah, yeah. I think it definitely takes a bit of unlearning. If uh, I know for me personally, even just in you know the approach and the education work that we do with clients, that you sort of as a financial advisor, you learn to explain things in a certain way or assume a certain level of knowledge around things, but. Um, yeah, it doesn't, doesn't always fit into that nice, neat box. And that's why, you know, I think these newer or different sort of advice models are, um, are getting traction with clients, but it doesn't, it doesn't always make it super easy when you're in that seat, um, mm. either. But mate, thank you. Appreciate you sharing the, um, the, the learnings around that. So I've taken a whole bunch of notes there. So, um, I'll, I'll, I'll get stuck into a few of those off the back of today. Um, but yeah, I'm keen yeah, to, I, I know that you've, you've, you've been on the podcast a couple of times before, but for anyone that isn't, um, a, a across that, can you just give us the sort of, um, higher level, like your service solution and how did you actually go about sort of coming up with that and, and building it out? Yeah. Yeah. So I guess if I, if I go back to give a bit of context, you know, I was fortunate to, to start my second or third role in advice with a guy called Kevin Bailey, who ran a company called the money managers, um, really successful guy, really ethical, um, guy ran a very good business out of Melbourne here. So I was fortunate to join, join his business. Um, they became involved in, um, you know, part of the new business side of that, of that as well. And then, you know, um, became a, uh, an equity partner in that firm as well. We then joined with Shadforth, which was, you know, uh, for those who know Shadforth, a really good bunch of, uh, you know, independently minded boutique firms that got together, high quality firms. Um, mm. So I've been fortunate to have have had some really good experience with some great people. You know, another another person that that people might be more familiar with who's still active in the industry, David Heights. You know, I worked very closely with David for many years. Um, and, and still, still catch up with him on various things here and there. So, so that's, so that's one thing I was really fortunate to have. And one of the things that I picked up and learned through working with some of these guys is, you know, the way you do things today isn't the way it's always going to be. You know, it's always challenging the status quo. It's trying to find better ways of doing things. Um, especially in an industry, um, which is becoming a profession that is so young. Um, and mm. I think that mindset is something that is just innate in me now. Um, 
that always trying to find something better and find something different. It creates a, a hell of a lot of problems as well because you can't just sit still and <laughs> you know, focus on doing what you're doing. But I think yeah. long term and long term it, it works out really well. Um, so I've generally got that mindset of, of always trying to find ways of doing things better and I'll always feel like, yeah, we're not doing things very well. We can always improve. We can always improve. We can always improve. And then people from the outside sometimes say, you know, you're actually doing, you know, what do you have to improve? It's it's going pretty well. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, that's, that's you, I'm sure you you feel like that as well, running a successful advice practice. So when, when I left, um, left Shadforth, the Shadforth business, which is a great business, really good quality advisors, um, delivers, you know, really good advice. Um, for me, it was about, when, 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 when Chadford listed and then got bought by IWF, it, it was, you know, huge, you know, IWF, massive group, all that sort of thing. Um, yeah. good people, but it, it became the size where it was harder to move and change. So that whole yeah. perspective that I had where I want to be able to challenge things and introduce new things, it becomes harder and harder in a large business. And for me, I think one of my mentors said, you know, can you see yourself? You know, they could tell that something wasn't quite sitting well with me. And they would just say, is it because, you know, can you see yourself here? in this business for the next 10 years. And mm. and when I thought about it that way, I just couldn't. So when I left um, and, and left left the business to start fresh, which is a really hard decision, um, I started with a blank piece of paper and in some ways not being allowed to take any clients with me and start from scratch, which again was massive challenge and, not ha- and having made the decision not to buy a book, um, it was all a blessing in disguise because I said, you know what, let me, what I didn't want to do is, you start the firm and just do the same thing somewhere else. I wanted to try yes. and give myself the opportunity to try and reinvent what it could be. And mm. and that enabled enabled me to kind of say, in an ideal world, what would client what would you know ideal client experience look like? Um, put compliance aside, put put the way that we've given advice in the past aside and how can we do it? And and it kind of landed me on the conclusion which has gradually developed and become stronger over the last few years, landed me on the point where we effectively want to just be adding massive value to clients. Um, there's mm. there's a selfish element in that as well. We don't want to be doing work that's not that impactful, I guess. There's lots of ways to make money in our, in our business in financial planning, and yep. that's, all, that's all fine. I think for me, I said it's not just about making money. It's about you know, having impact in the world and having the impact in people's lives. And so in order to do that, my assessment was we needed to approach it in a particular way. We needed to be not focused on products, but focused on the clients that we have. And a lot of these things are consistent with some of the messaging out there from, from you know, other advisors and, you know, I think in the XY group as well. But, you know, really challenging ourselves on that to make sure that there's nothing that's going to push us in the wrong direction when we're trying to do add, add that massive value yeah. to clients. Yeah. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so that's kind of a high level premise, which, which I think is important in, in the way that we try and try and run the business. So when you were, when you were working through this process of, you know, blank piece of paper, you're thinking about the client experience. I'm just interested because I know that a lot of people in the XY community are either, you know, considering starting businesses or constantly revisiting their service offerings and what they do to to help their clients. Did you start with a specific client in mind or was it targeted? You mentioned, you know, uh, and I know we were just chatting a little bit offline, but about like clients that you can add massive value to, like client experience is obviously very, very important. But then when you're building that advice practice, it's like, well, what, what are you actually going to do? Like what problems are you going to solve? How did you tackle that part of of your service development? I think the reality is with that is that it's gonna it's gonna change and evolve, and for us it definitely has. Uh, we've just um, well last year we introduced a new adjustment to the way that we service our clients, which um, which you know we're testing out, and I think it's 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 in the in the with the aim of delivering massive value to clients and doing more for clients and adding more value to them. So it's. I think the starting point is always understanding why you're in the business and what you're trying to do, why and why you're doing it. And, and so, so the way that we, the way that I was able to try and come to that is remove the things that you have to do that you don't think are, you know, for the client. So for a good example is the way that we bring our new clients on. We onboard our new clients without an SOA. We have an ongoing service agreement. 
to do things for them, to help them with particular things in their life. And Mm -hmm. when they need an SOA, we do an SOA. So starting with a blank piece of paper enabled me to go, hang on, so is a statement of advice valuable to the client? I came to the conclusion is that the statement of advice itself is not. It's an important piece when you're making certain recommendations, but the client doesn't value it. What adds the value in my mind was the client experience, the conversations we're having, the delivery and the execution of the advice and connecting it with the client's purpose and values. That's what I identified as being actually valuable to the client. So that led us to then saying, well, hang on a sec, do we need to push a client through a process so we can give them a statement of advice, collect a fee, and has that actually been a valuable exercise for the client and have we focused too much on this thing in the process that's actually not that valuable to them? And, and mm. so that's the way that we've we've redesigned it now. And we haven't had a single client who said, hang on a sec, I wanted a statement of advice. How come I haven't got a statement of advice? <laughs> or, you know, no way. Um, <laughs> so so you, you, that, that's, a good, that's just an, an example of, you know, just really thinking about what does the client get the most value from? I know mm. that if I've got to spend, if, if the business has to spend 10 hours doing a statement of advice that that you're using to explain everything to the client, I know that the client would get better value from 10 hours of conversations with, yeah. me, with the advisor or members in the team explaining the advice. So yeah. it's a diff, yeah, th- and, and that's sort of the test that we've always had. Is this a, Is this valuable to the client or not? Yeah. And obviously, you know, you, your business has been going for a bit and, you you know, we all start somewhere and it's great to have a great plan yeah. around what we're going to do. But as for our clients, we know that, you know, life doesn't follow our nice, neat, uh, straight lines. And then we learn stuff on the way and things change and all that sort of stuff. For you, if you think about your service what and, and what you do for clients and how... Over the last sort of four and a bit years, what's what have been the biggest changes or shifts in in what you've done, and what what sort of what were the the insights that drove those? Good question. Probably the biggest change has been this change in how we service our ongoing clients. Um, so as I said, with our new clients, we don't push them through a process really quickly. We don't charge an upfront financial planning fee. We basically start the engagement as an ongoing client from day one. Um, mm-hmm. and we're not push we're not pushing them in a particular direction because we need them to so we can do an SOA or so we can get paid on farm or so we can get an insurance commission. So we're not driven by any of those things, which really allows us to let the client circumstances guide how we deliver that that onboarding process. Um yeah. so from an ongoing client perspective, however, you know, clients been onboarded, you've got a relationship with them, you know them pretty well, and now our job is to make sure that they achieve the things that that are important to them and make adjustments along the way. So I guess in, in a world that potentially we're trying to make advice more affordable and we're trying to make it more efficient, we've gone from annual meetings to four, um, four touch points, four key areas that we touch on during the year. Mm-hmm. And so our workload has increased significantly, but the the aim with this and this is to be proven but the aim is that um, clients are going to get a lot more value and we will be far more structured in the way that we deliver our advice and and we don't miss anything that that that's really important to the client i think it came about because you know you have your your typical annual review process which is you know pretty standard but what i found having done sort of an annual review process for 15 years is that you know you go into the meeting you got an hour an hour and a half and there's a whole lot of things that if you're covering everything, there's there's so many things to cover, right? Yeah. But what tends to happen is the client ends up talking about the things that they want to talk about and raise. The advisor addresses those things, but then focuses on the things that they want to address and raise. But there's always a whole lot of things that just get a bit of lip service, if anything, or just don't get done. Um, yes. And so without having the structure around delivering all the things that the client needs, it's easy to miss things. Um, mm. And I think that's not necessarily from the perspective of having to do particular things. But for us, most of the value that clients will get is that they don't have to worry about money anymore and they know that they're going to achieve the things that are most important in their lives. And a large part of that comes from knowing that your advisor is going to take care of the things that need to be taken care of, whether mm. or not the client remembers or not. 
So yes. clients are knowing that we're going to go through this four-stage cycle, four, four cycle during the year and they know that we're going to address these things with them, you know, the, the, the concept is that they're just going to go, well, I don't know, I never have to think about this stuff. I just yeah. do what Except I'm Except when I'm told to, which is a good yeah, place yeah, to be, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as long as we can deliver that with efficiency, I mean, you've got to be able to be able to run a business profitably so that you exist for your clients yes. um, in the future. As long as we can deliver that that uh, you know efficiently, then then that I think is going to be um, yeah that that's a change that we're seeing. We started implementing it last year, um, obviously teething teething problems, and you do the best you can do. Uh, so mm-hmm. we did it okay, but this year we've sort of ramped it up in terms of putting structure around that and really make it, delivering on that as much as possible. I love that because I think that like, yeah, and I've said this a few times before in, in conversations with people that I think, you know, historically evolution of financial advice that in, you know, back in the nineties and noughties, you sort of needed a financial advisor to get um, financial products. Like it was like a necessary thing. And then we evolved into this age of planning where it's like, you know, people, and I, I, and this is obviously generalisation because there's always been a lot of fantastic advisors out there that do deliver really well for clients. But generally speaking, you know, big focus on delivering financial plans and the pretty bar charts and pie graphs and stuff and people are getting all excited. But as you know, like when the, the rubber hits the road is when the action starts happening and people walk out of the office, like it's great for them to walk out all excited. But we want the dollars in the bank account, the, the investment income building up, you know, the debt going down, all of these things. And um, I feel like we're now at the next evolution where it's like people are coming for these results. Like, yeah, plan is a plan is a plan. And there's a lot of value in going through a planning process. But ultimately, the plan is a tool to help people get the outcomes, to get the results that they want. And um yeah, I think, you know, I have a big focus on that stuff in our business. Um, great to see more and more people doing that. And I think that if we, if every financial planner is delivering amazing results for our clients, then that's just going to massively increase the, you know, public perception, I suppose, but ultimately the, the ultimate, and public perception is important, but ultimately the actual value and, and outcomes that people are getting. And then more and more people are going to turn to advice. And I think for a lot of times we talk about this glass ceiling of, you know, 20% of Aussies getting advice or whatever, that I think that that's the key to unlocking that and smashing through. So, um, yeah, I think that's for, for us that um, people, they there's like almost like a dual accountability that they're coming for the results. If we're not delivering the results, and it's like, well, why are you paying it? Like, why are we paying you if you're not doing what we mm. said? Now, sometimes it's things out of our control. Sometimes it's back on the clients. But um, I think that as as planners, the more we can get behind having this amazing solution that is going to deliver those results, yeah, the better our clients are and the, the better it is for growth and the the, the future of, of our, you know, burgeoning profession, I suppose, to, to be a little bit cliched there. But, um, yeah, 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 great to see. Tell no, 100%. Us- there's, something you, there's something you touched on there, Ben, which I think is important, which is, um, you know, consumers getting the value and, for well one thing that's helped force us to be really really conscious of, of of making sure we're delivering value is is telling clients and being willing to tell clients if you're not getting value from our relationship then you shouldn't be a client you shouldn't be paying for something unless you're getting massive value um it's kind of really bad for you know financial advice to tell someone to pay for something if they're not getting value for it hmm. um so just like that our services as well um need to be really valuable to the people we're dealing with. And I think consumers are going to be want be, be more discerning around getting that value. And if they're not getting that value, it's going to be, uh, you, you know, they're, they're not going to be as willing to be paying for it. So, which is, which is yeah. right. I guess that's, that's the way it should be, right? Fair enough. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, totally. Mate, I could honestly chat about this um, all, all day. And uh, I know that you've unpacked a lot of that stuff on the on the podcast before, but really appreciate you sharing your insights there. My last question for you is that if you could go back to your um, uh, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed self that, you know, the, on to, to you the day after you received your uh, ASIC registration when you set up your business, basically day, day dot of the company, what would be your your one um, piece of advice to give yourself at that time? Yeah, that's a great question, hard one to answer, but I think it would be, and it's always hard because knowing what you know now, you can always answer those questions, right? But yeah. it would it would be trying to be as clear as possible on why you're doing what you're doing and and how you want it to look in the future. 
um, you know, the way we do things now and even the sorts of clients we help now has shifted. It hasn't shifted so much that I think we got it wrong, but it could have been clearer and better. And I think yeah. as well, saying no to things that maybe you, you yeah, I think saying no to no to things is always is always really hard to do when you're starting, but it can it can set yeah. you up because saying yes to too many, many things um take you know does take you away from the things that are most important whether that's um you know business development or spending time on the business you know mm. getting it right um you know you need it's hard because it's a balance between uh you know having revenue when people want to work with you uh, <laughs> but you know to, to be honest that you know early on we did take on clients that we probably shouldn't have maybe because we were we were doing too much work for them and then they weren't paying us enough or something like that and uh yep. we hadn't worked out how much we need to charge and enough and things like that so but but that that holds you back and um the it, I, I don't know if 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 it's possible to know that up front but i think it's important <laughs> to, to, to be thinking about those things um to try and avoid that as much as possible but Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it is, I actually just made a note of that to go like, why, why are we doing what we're doing? Like, what is it for our clients? What is it for our business? What is it for the team? What is it for us personally? I think um, mm. yeah, it's easy to lose sight of that because you just caught up doing things and doing the next thing and doing the next thing. And there's always a next thing and 10 next things in, in front of that thing. So um, yeah. yeah, I think it's a, it's a good idea to, to take that uh, stock because when you apply that lens, it does bring a different level of thinking to, yeah, if you can if you can start again, like you say, and I think we have the opportunity to reinvent ourselves all the time. Obviously, change management is is challenging, but um, the good thing about advice is that you could completely change, turn about face on your service model, and for the next person that walks in your door, you tell them that this is the way that it is, and they don't know that you you know it's the first time you've done it, and, it's, and it, you've, you've been doing it differently every time. And for me, that was something that always I always enjoyed that about financial advice that you can make some little tweaks and people with obviously with good intentions but like people don't know that it's it's any different and then it's like a test tube that you can um you know tinker and, and measure and see what works and what connects and what doesn't but um yeah, yeah mate interesting times ahead Absolutely. um the really appreciate you sharing your insights buddy um look forward to seeing you continue smash it mate yeah no great to be on ben and learn from each other and the community so no really great and good stuff on the podcast good to have you on and um, I don't know who's better yet, mate, whether it's you or Clay, but you can tell me offline, don't worry. I'll make sure that I relate extremely <laughs> accurately to Clay. <laughs> uh, awesome, man. Okay, thanks again. I'll catch you next time. Yeah, brilliant. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks for the chat.